hi everybody good evening and thank you for joining us for another one of our um discovery evenings uh i am emma healy i'm one of the travel consultants at wildlife worldwide um and also lead some of our photography trips and have led uh one with alex who will be joining us which was very hello, hello. <laughs> um so Tonight we have a really fabulous talk, um, which I'm really excited about, never mind you guys, um, about rainforest photography workshops. Um, so we have Nick Garbutt. Say hello, Nick. Evening, everyone. Uh, and Alex Hyde. Good evening to you all. <laughs> Um, so for those who don't know Nick and Alex, they are um, freelance wildlife photographers who run workshops uh, around the UK and around the world uh, from... Africa, Austria, to rainforests of Borneo, Ecuador, where? Peru, many, many. There's probably not one they haven't been rifling through the leaf litter in. Um, so they're here to talk to us about uh, what you can find there, what's entail what these photography workshops entail, a um, bit about the kit and some of their tips and techniques. Um, so yeah, really exciting evening in store. Um, so Nick's going to start us off and then we'll have a little bit of a switch over and Alex will take over. Um, but yeah, hoping to be kind of done by around 9.30ish, but we'll see how we get on. Um, throughout the talk, uh, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, some of them we'll ask, uh, I might try and answer while they're talking. And if not, then I'll put them to the guys at the end. Um, and I think that's about it. I will stop and I will hand you over to Nick. Enjoy. Thank you, Emma. Good evening once again, everybody. Um, as Emma said, uh, we're going to talk this evening about specifically about our programme of rainforest photography workshops. Um, I'm lucky enough through the course of what I do to travel to lots of parts of the globe. But if I had to pick a single type of location, a single habitat, where I'd prefer to spend my time, it would always be a tropical rainforest. Um, and I hope this particular photo um, taken in the rainforest of Borneo kind of alludes to why that is. There is nowhere, in my view, quite as magical as a rainforest um, for the atmosphere that it creates. It's just an enchanted place simply to be let alone to explore and discover wildlife and obviously indulge your interest in photography. Um, so I've been enchanted by rainforests since childhood and my first experience of working abroad in the tropics was in the rainforest of Borneo and um, that love and passion has never left me. I still feel like a, a, a little boy when I'm exploring a rainforest and visiting a rainforest. So uh, I hope we can enthuse you um, with that sort of passion as we progress through this evening. Um, Alex and I have over the years visited any number of rainforests, but have built up a program of trips currently, which encompasses four rainforest locations, um, Costa Rica being one, um, Ecuador, is uh, the second, um, Peru the third, and Borneo the fourth. Um, so what I'm going to do for my half of the trip is give you an overview of the trips uh, to Latin America, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Peru, which have broad similarities for obvious reasons, um, but are sufficiently different to all be justified in their own right. And then I'll finish off with a slightly more in-depth look at Borneo, which I think if I had to really, if you really pressed me to pick one, which was my absolute favourite, it would it would be Borneo. Um, partly because of my sort of past history and first experiences, which obviously sowed a seed of interest. Um, so I'll start by giving you a broader overview of the trips to the new world, to Latin America, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru, which, as I say, have similarities. One of the things that is common to all of those trips, and indeed to Borneo, but let's stick with Latin American trips to begin with, is that 
you get to visit and experience a variety of rainforests. Not all tropical rainforests are created equal. So this is a more lowland rainforest in the Amazon part of Ecuador. Um, and obviously the kind of habitat and the kind of species you might encounter here are rather different to a more montane rainforest, often referred to as cloud forest in um, the New World, um, here in Costa Rica, um, where the undergrowth is much more dense, often with bamboos and various other species. So the feel of these places is very different. And obviously the different animals, birds, invertebrates, etc., that you encounter in these different subsets within the sort of tropical rainforest bracket are very different and the photographic experiences that each present and often challenges they present is very different as well but all of them have their strengths and all of them are thoroughly um, interesting and engaging and wonderful to visit um one of the features um of any particular location in a rainforest is its diversity. Of course, that's one of its great strengths. There's just such amazing diversity. And I think that's perhaps illustrated if I were just to recount uh, my experiences. The very first time I visited this location, which is a lowland location in Costa Rica on the Osa Peninsula. It's one of the lodges that we visit on um, our Costa Rica trip. And the first time I came here, um, I was on a recce, so I wasn't with a group, um, and I just checked in, was walking from the reception area across to where my chalet was going to be. And as you can see from this photograph, the chalet had an utterly spectacular location. Um, and as I was walking across um, 100 metres from reception to this particular chalet, there was a group of coates um, bumbled across in front of me and you know, that in itself was just fantastic um wonderful to see a group of coates and i got to the chalet and there was commotion in the trees above and i looked up and there was a group of spider monkeys there and I thought, wow this is how good is this and then i got out onto this decking and looked down and in the pacific ocean beneath me there was a female humpback whale with its calf and then shortly after that there were scarlet macaws flew by and i'd literally only been in this place for a handful of minutes it seemed and i'd seen all of these amazing things um and i just thought how how good is this um and obviously that particular location has now been a, a sort of central um feature on all of the costa rica trips we've done but it alludes to just the amazing diversity that you can encounter in a rainforest and really the unexpected you never quite know what's around the corner one of the features of most of or any number of the lodges that you might visit on any of the latin american trips is that often they're centered or some of the features that are uh, real highlights are some of the birds that you can see because obviously there are amazing bright colored birds macaws being one of them this is another um, feature for scarlet macaws this time in Ecuador, a playlick uh, on the Napo River in Ecuador. And again, it, while the trip isn't built around seeing um, spectacles like this, features like this that you can pin part of a day around obviously are focal points and bring um, sort of photographic highlights to a trip. And Lots of the places in the New World, in Latin America, have features revolving around bird species and so forth, which give you opportunities that you would never get elsewhere. These are, as I say, scarlet macaws in Ecuador. But if you go to Peru, for instance, you can go to hides like this to see similar playlick features, albeit along the banks of a river, where you might see red and green macaws. Um, which again, spectacular profusion and numbers and offered wonderful photographic opportunities. Similarly, there are lodges that are built around visiting leks or other areas where birds congregate. This is a lek in Manu in Peru for obviously Cock of the Rock. Um, and similarly, this is one in Ecuador for the same species. 
Um, and one of the features in many of these Latin American countries, whether it's within a national park or adjacent to a national park, is that often linked with private enterprise, locals have set up and set aside areas of forest where they will attract in or allow a bird viewing or other animal viewing feature to develop and encourage. And it just allows you a chance to see things that ordinarily your chances of seeing would be very slim. So it's one of the examples where ecotourism has really added to local economies because people have cottoned on to the value that their local wildlife has and have developed it in as many ways as they possibly can. And certainly rainforests can be very difficult places to see things. Obviously the habitat can be very challenging. It's very dense and therefore sometimes seeing things is very difficult and animals are shy. Birds are often shy. So these places where um, viewing facilities have been developed to allow you to specifically see spectacles through either hides or gradual habituation of the species just offer you a window into things that you never normally see. It's very much a feature of many of the destinations in Latin America, whether it be Costa Rica, um, Ecuador, Peru, or I'm sure if you go to other destinations within Latin America, they would have similar features. Hummingbirds, of course, always feature in most of the locations you would visit in any Latin American country. This particular um, violet sable wings are in Costa Rica. Um, this is a booted racket tail uh, that I took recently on a trip to um, Ecuador. Um, and any number of um, lodges and locations will have feeders where routinely 10 dozen, even 20 different species of hummingbird might visit on a regular basis. So again, it gives you opportunity to see and photograph things relatively easily. I mentioned the idea of private enterprise setting up options to attract birds in. Here's another example, um, this time again from Ecuador. This is a bird, uh, the plate-billed mountain toucan, that when I first visited Ecuador, um, was very challenging to see. And I remember catching a glimpse of this bird, which is normally quite shy and lives in montane cloud forest areas um, on the Pacific slope of the Andes in Ecuador. And I just caught glimpses of this bird. And obviously it's a stunning bird. So you put in a lot of time to see it. Now through enterprise, private enterprise and someone being entrepreneurial, they've devoted time and energy to setting up a location where this bird is attracted in to feeders and comes on a, if not daily, but most days and has been gradually habituated. So you can sit in relative comfort and see not only this bird, but other, but other birds that are visiting in relatively easily. So again, it's adding value to the economy, but it's also meaning that you have a chance of seeing and photographing birds that would be utterly impossible ordinarily, or at least very difficult, relatively easily. That sort of principle is probably taken to its greatest um, extent in Costa Rica, where there are lots of different places where things are set up or attracted in, which is obviously great because it gives you opportunities to see things easily and get nice photographs. But its disadvantage is it becomes quite prescriptive and you're, you're really taking pictures that someone else has conceived. They've set up the area for you to take pictures. I would suspect if you were to look around magazines and anywhere you might see wildlife trips advertised, particularly to Costa Rica. You would see a photograph that looked something like this. This is a keel-billed toucan, which is obviously spectacular, incredibly brightly colored, often used to advertise trips to Costa Rica. And I can guarantee you just about any photograph you've seen of this bird is taken at this lodge because it's set up specifically for photography, which is terrific, but it does mean pictures become quite samey. And one of the things that Alex and I are really keen to encourage is obviously anyone coming on our trips to try and get pictures that are a bit different. So while these opportunities are terrific for seeing things and getting nice photos, we would never build an entire trip around this sort of photography because 
you're not really having as much opportunity to really engage your own imagination and so forth to get pictures that might be different. Um, mammals, of course, are often challenging to see in rainforests, although, again, some species around lodges are much easier to see. So you have a chance of getting nice photographs. This is a capuchin monkey in Peru. Um, here, a squirrel monkey taken on the recent trip to Ecuador. And as I say, around lodges, some of the primates, some of the other mammal species become quite tolerant and habituated, which gives you opportunities to see them and photograph them. But again, you're having to react to opportunities that the animals are presenting to you. And it's really how you want what opportunities you get and how you want to interpret those that dictate how your picture how your pictures ultimately look. I alluded in the story I recounted earlier to spider monkeys in Costa Rica. This was taken at the very same lodge, not on that first trip, but uh, at the same place, South American, um, Central American spider monkey um, on the Osa Peninsula. Um, and I mentioned the coates as well. This again taken at the same lodge. So these are animals that you will almost certainly see, but can never really predict how you might see them and therefore how you might be able to photograph them. Um, so you're having to react to situations that are presented to you and see what you're able to get. But obviously during the course of a workshop, a photography workshop where you're spending prolonged periods of time in one location, you would hope the number of opportunities you get for photography um, uh, are plenty. But as I mentioned, one of the things that Alex and I really try to encourage is to try and indulge in photography where you're having much more influence and control over the images you take, which often means pictures of smaller subjects. A lot of the lodges in the new world have moth traps, so that obviously gives you plenty of scope and opportunity. Um, so we work as closely as we can with clients taking pictures often of smaller things where you're able to take time and use flash and so forth to um, to influence how your picture ultimately looks. And it gives you time to think about your image, not just simply take an image that's a representation of what you see with your own eyes, but actually maybe impart some sort of um, creativity into an image so it has something a little more different. Macro stuff obviously um, uh, abounds in rainforests. So you have opportunities from even the smallest things like these leaf cutter ants up to larger invertebrates. This is a um, tailless whip scorpion. This shot was taken using focus stacking technique. So again, something else that you would be able to develop and um, get to grips with if it wasn't a technique you were familiar with already. Um, and intuitively, I think most people would think if you're taking pictures of close up pictures of small things, you tend to use small apertures. So you get big depths of field. Again, something that we would try to encourage you away from is the opposite, using large apertures. So you're throwing lots of the picture out of focus and really emphasizing certain aspects of a subject. Um, which gives a much more impressionistic feel to an image. It's not simply representational. Using foliage as a window to look through, it's imperative if you're taking photos in a rainforest that someone seeing your pictures knows you've actually been to the rainforest. It's no point in taking a picture that could have been taken in an aquarium or a captive setup. You want to really give the viewer of your photos that feeling that you've been in amongst the vegetation and in amongst the undergrowth. So you're feeling like you're part of that rainforest scene. This is an Osborne's pit viper, again, taken on the recent trip to Ecuador. Um, and even if you're just wandering around and taking pictures, reacting to something you might see, a little bit of interpretation can go a long way. This is an utterly bog standard fairly dull shot of a beautiful butterfly, a heliconid butterfly, again in Ecuador. Um, and this simply landed on this leaf and I quickly took this shot and it happened to stay there. So it just gave me a little bit longer to think about 
what I might achieve. And if you look to the right hand side of the picture, you can see there's this really bright area of highlights. So I thought, why not use that behind the subject so the light is streaming through the butterfly and then you get something different. So I literally moved myself a meter to the left. So that really bright area was behind the butterfly. And suddenly the picture becomes so much more interesting. I deliberately also underexposed this image by three stops. So it turns everything really dark and that emphasizes that light area. And then think about, well, what shape is the subject? What shape is the twig, the branch, the vine that it's on? And it becomes even better when you turn the camera vertically. So there's a, a sort of thought process there on how I can turn something that initially looks fairly ordinary into something that looks a little more interesting. Obviously, camouflage subjects are fabulous in rainforests. So working with something like this dead leaf manicated in, this again is a focus stack, is the sort of thing that we would really spend time with on a rainforest trip or this dead leaf mimic moth in the leaf litter snakes as well when you're able to find them local guides are able to find them wonderful to be able to show in the context of their environment that's the key showing them in the context of their environment so you know you've actually been in the rainforest small subjects poison dart frogs again this is in costa rica but taken with a lens that allows me to show the frog in the context of its rainforest and taking that to an extreme using fisheye lenses. This is in Costa Rica with um, Costa Rican red knee tarantula um, that was we found wandering around on the rainforest floor in the middle of the day and were able to photograph this using a fisheye lens. And again, take that to the extreme this time in Peru with a, an Amazon horned frog. Um, this is with an eight mil fisheye. So you're seeing 180 degrees of view within that sphere there. But again, it's all about showing the subject in the context of the rainforest. Night walks, too, are always a feature of our rainforest trips because an awful lot of this really special stuff that you can see, find and see in a rainforest is active at night. Often means getting out, getting wet, getting your wellies on, walking up and down streams. But things like frogs and insects and so forth are obviously fantastic along streams. And it also means that if you're going out at night, you really have to get to grips with and start to use flash successfully, which is obviously a technique that is very powerful, not only at night, but during the day. But it's imperative at night, of course. Um, and that, again, is something that we feature very heavily on our trip. So you start to use flash creatively. Um, this is a maiden's veil fungus in Peru. But as you can see, this shot was taken with actually, you could see two flash guns in that picture, but it was actually taken with three in total. This again in Peru using two flash guns, one fired from behind, one fired from in front. So light illuminates through coming streaming through this leaf mimic catered in. So it's looking like it's glowing. And a waxy monkey frog again in Peru. This particular shot at night, had I taken it with a single flash gun, you'd just see the frog and not much of the background. So I actually used two flash guns on the frog and one flash gun on the background. So you're seeing more of the rainforest, even though it's at night. So that I hope has given you a very quick um, cursory overview of the sorts of experiences you might get on the trips to Latin America. I'm just going to go into a little more detail for the next 10 minutes or so um, with respect to our Borneo trip, um, which we're next running in September of this year. Um, as I mentioned, if I had to pick one over any other, I think Borneo would be my favourite. This is possibly my favourite piece of rain rainforest anywhere in the world. This is Danum Valley in the lowlands of um, Saba in Borneo. Um, but again, huge diversity within that sort of broad rainforest context. We now run our trips that encompass the higher mountain forests of Mount Kinabalu, which is so, so different to the lowland rainforests. Um, in Kinabalu, a lot of the emphasis is on some of the amazing plant species that are endemic to um, not only the mountain or certainly the highland areas, 
within Borneo. This is obviously one of the many pitcher plant species. And if you get very lucky, you might also get a chance to see and photograph a Rafflesia, the largest single bloom in the world. And um, this is Rafflesia keithii, which is particularly, um, can be quite common in certain areas on the lower slopes of Mount Kinabalu. Um, but the upland um, forest areas on Mount Kinabalu, where there are lots of streams like this, are wonderful areas to explore, not only during the day, but at night. Often for the smaller things, you won't see primates at these sorts of altitudes. So you, the time spent in these forests really is concentrated on smaller things, invertebrates, frogs, reptiles, etc. This is one of the unusual, unusual invertebrates. It's called a trilobite beetle. Unusual, not only because of the way it looks, but this, this is actually a female. But unusually, the female remains in the larval stage. It never attains full adulthood. So it even breeds in the larval stage, which is obviously very, very peculiar. But this is um, one of the unusual things that you might find grubbing around in leaf litter and in rotting wood when you're up on the higher slopes of Mount Kinabalu. Spectacular frogs, as I mentioned, often at night. This is a mossy bush frog, which was photographed along one of those streams um, on Mount Kinabalu. From the high mountain areas, we drop down into the lowlands, which in different places have uh, different uh, areas that uh, are incredibly diverse. This is arguably one of the most diverse places in all of Southeast Asia. It's the Kinabatangan River wetlands in the lowlands of Borneo. Um, which is now a mosaic of forested areas and sadly oil palm plantation and a lot of the conservation work that's taking place in these areas is to maintain forest corridors and maintain areas that still exist as forests so wildlife can move between them but it's still a fantastically diverse area wonderful to explore on boats the main river channels and the side river channels as well, which are bristling with life. Terrific for seeing various primate species, proboscis monkeys being one of the real highlights, of course. Good chance of seeing orangutans and various other monkeys as well. Um, even if you get lucky, bony and pygmy elephants can be seen along the Kinabatangan River. Um, and from the largest mammal in Borneo down to one of the smallest, this is the pygmy squirrel. Um, this I'll state the obvious, is a composite image. So I managed to get the shot of the squirrel on the tree. And af after the squirrel had run away, I asked the local guy to go and place his hand on the tree, took a second shot, and then I've montaged them together just to give you an idea of the relative size of this wonderful little animal. Um, and a short distance away from Kinabatangan River is one of the other places that we would spend time and visit, Gamantong Caves, which aren't necessarily everyone's cup of tea, but do offer some fantastic opportunities. They, some people don't like going in the caves because they're very smelly. Of course, they're full of bats and um, uh, cave swiftlets, which um, uh, the nests are harvested by local communities because they're an important commodity for um, making bird's nest soup, for instance. So they're very valuable. But there's lots of fantastic invertebrates which offer photographic opportunities, one being long-legged centipedes or scooter gerids, um, but lots of other things in and around these cave systems. And the forests themselves around Gamantong are fantastic places to see primates, orangutans, for instance. This is a maroon or red, maroon langur or red leaf monkey that again is often seen if you visit Gamantong Cave. So um, a lot of people tend to visit the caves for one hour, two hours and then go on our trips, we're hoping to spend a little longer in and around not just the caves, but the forests adjacent to the caves, because there's so much more potentially on offer there. Um, and the final place on our trip that we really do go to town and spend an entire week is Danham Valley, which, as I mentioned earlier, is arguably or perhaps my favourite piece of rainforest anywhere in the world. Utterly sumptuous um, area um, of pristine, untouched rainforest uh, in which there is a beautiful lodge, which obviously makes the stay within the rainforest all the more comfortable um, and pleasant. Um, and because this lodge has been here for now well over 30 years, 
virtually all of the wildlife that lives in the area has become completely and utterly habituated to people being there. So it often makes viewing wildlife easier than it otherwise would be. One of the things that's quite different in Borneo as compared to the examples I've been talking about from Latin America is that they don't go down the route of baiting animals in, providing feed stations, creating photographic staged setup areas. So everything in Borneo that you're likely to see, you're just seeing as you come across it, as you find it. Uh, and you really have no idea what you may come across. Danum is a fantastic place to see orangutans. Um, and whenever you go, there's always orangs within the vicinity, sometimes more, sometimes fewer, depends on the fruiting trees. But again, you can't really predict when you might come across them, but you could certainly, having talked to local guides, work out areas where your chances are better than others, for instance. If there's a fruiting tree, then that always increases your chances. Very good chance of seeing gibbons in Danum Valley as well, um, as well as several other species of primate. <coughs> Birds too, as I mentioned, there's no feeding setups as such in Borneo, but nonetheless, seeing big showy birds like rhinoceros hornbill is almost guaranteed. Getting photographs of them may be a little more challenging, but nonetheless, seeing them, you're guaranteed pretty much to see rhino hornbills and several other species in Danum Valley. Um, if you get lucky, there are times when bird sightings and behaviour can be a little more predictable. This is a wonderful male great Argus pheasant that on occasion um, they uh, clear and construct a dancing area on the forest floor where they display to females. And if you happen to find one of those and sit quietly, then often the birds will show themselves and obviously allow you to get pictures that otherwise you wouldn't get. But a fantastic bird to be able to see but of course it's the smaller things that are perhaps more easily encountered that can provide fabulous photo tech, um, opportunities this is this wonderful shot is one of alex's from one of our first trips to borneo of these um cup fungi but you know a shot like this isn't something that you just get by simply walking up up and taking a snap of it this takes thought and um care in positioning the camera and then appropriately lighting it so you make the most of it so you could quite easily spend half an hour working out how to get a shot like this and make the most of it obviously in a rainforest frogs are one of the highlights this is perhaps my favorite frog anywhere in the world and i've spent hours at times not only looking for borne and horned frogs but once i found one photographing it and trying to think of ways to photograph it photograph it in a more innovative way this is obviously just a fairly representational picture of the frog in the leaf litter but then showing one with a wide angle lens really in the context of the rainforest is much more pleasing and then something that alludes to it being sort of tucked away again um, just something that may be a little bit different but always trying to think of something that's just not quite straight representational photography snakes too you never know when you might encounter them, but really the emphasis is on trying to take pictures that show that you are in the rainforest and your subject is part of that overall rainforest environment. This is a keeled pit viper in Danum Valley. Wonderful insects also. Um, this is one of the um, flower orchid mimic mantises that um, is sometimes encountered in Danum. And fantastic beetles, of course. This is a three-horned atlas rhinoceros beetle. Um, again, taken with a macro lens that is wide angle, so you're able to show it in the context of its rainforest home. One or two other techniques you might be able to employ here. If you look carefully, you can see that there's a giant emperor scorpion tucked away on this um, log. But if we then just waft a little bit of UV light over it, something quite magical happens, as it does with all scorpions that glow with UV light. But again, it just offers a nice photographic alternative and I'll just finish off by saying something about night walks in Danum Valley in Borneo in general a fantastic additional um, uh, pleasure uh, and photographic challenge and exercise primates you might see include western tarsier there's also slow loris that you might see um, 
if you get very, very lucky, there's even opportunity to see some of the carnivores. This is a leopard cat. Um, not easy to see and certainly not easy to photograph, but once in a while, you just never know in a rainforest what might show up. There have even been sightings in Danham and in recent years of clouded leopards. Um, I've seen one once fleetingly in Danham, but I know people that have seen them very well. Last time I was in Danham, uh, in November 2022, um, there was this wandering around at night underneath the lodge. I'd never seen one before. This is a banded civet, normally incredibly difficult to see. And for whatever reason, this particular individual had come around the lodge, was very tolerant, and you could wander around and follow it, as I did on several nights, and was able to get some nice pictures. So you just never know what might show up. So I think it's one of the things that I love about Borneo more than anywhere else is that no matter how often you visit, how often you go out for a walk, whether it's day or night in a rain in those rainforests, there's always the opportunity of something really amazing showing up and you just getting an experience that you couldn't get in any other way. Um, I'm just using this slide as my transition. So Alex will now be preparing himself to um, start entertaining you. Um, this is just an outline of the trips that Alex and I have um, set up or in the pipeline. And um, I think Alex will also show you a reminder of this later in the um, at the end of his talk. So I'll now pass over to Alex and um, let him continue. Uh, thanks, Nick. We're just going to squat, swap, share, swap screen shares. That's not easy to say. Um, so grab a quick top up if you need. We've had one question in so far. If there are any that are kind of brewing, do just ask them on the chat um, or on the Q&A, and I will put them to Nick and Alex at the end. Uh, Emma, are we OK? Yeah. Good. Excellent. We're grand. Carry on. Of course we are. We know what we're doing. Um, Nick and I are reasonable at photography, but um, I tell you that the panic that descends before we give a joint Zoom talk I mean, poor Emma, what she had to put up with earlier, getting us prepared for this. Um, anyway, let, let's see how we get on. So thank you, Nick, for that um, wonderful introduction to our locations that we've been lucky enough to see over the years. Um, we're always um, looking out for new locations, I should add. So the trouble is uh, with us is that we're never short of ideas of where to go. It's just fitting it all in. Um, so any of you who've met us in person will have um, probably heard us discussing all sorts of plans around the world, but we are gradually getting there and um, we're turning these into tours um, as and when we can. So this scene here, um, I think it was taken in Costa Rica, reflects the um, downside of being a creative wildlife photographer, I suppose. I always think you got to bring those different focal length lenses with you to have the um, creative options. It seems slightly ironic that um, I focus on particularly the smaller subjects, and yet I seem to have the heaviest bag out of everyone. Um, so there's no bazooka lens in there, um, but sometimes I'll have six different macro lenses with me, various flash guns, and it all certainly weighs quite a lot. Like Nick, I fell in love with tropical rainforests as a child. And um, I remember the first visit I made to one was in Peru when I was in my early 20s. And I've, I've never looked back. I knew it had to be a bigger part of my life at that stage. Uh, it's quite hard work finding subjects in rainforests. There's this sort of misconception that it's swarming with subjects around every corner. But I'll tell you what, when you're leading a photographic group through a forest um, it can seem rather sparse at times um, I suppose maybe only about three percent of the sunlight gets down to the forest floor they say um, through the forest canopy so in established primary rainforest quite a lot of the species will be up in the canopy um, and you have to be really up on your game and working with the local guides to find things on a regular basis 
However, we do have some advantages that we can employ from our lifelong interest in natural history. I know Nick was just like me as a kid, always outside, always looking at nature. And I remember seeing a scene much like this. This is a mother centipede showing brood care. She's wrapped herself round her young there. Um, I remember seeing a scene much like this as a kid in my garden in Croydon, where I grew up. Well, this is one that I saw um, earlier in January in Ecuador, and it's a completely different species of centipede, yes, but she's showing exactly the same behaviour um, as the one I saw as a child. So I suppose using your natural history knowledge is key to good nature photography. What Nick and I have always wanted to do with our tours is give people enough time to do creative photography to spend that time um, turning ideas into actual photographs. And from my own experience, uh, this can take a very, very long time. Nick alluded to a, a shot maybe taking half an hour. Um, I've certainly seen him spend a lot longer than that on a, a composition before, and I'm no different. And I think um, we've always tried to get away from just ticking things off, you know, ticking that birding list, etc. It's much more important to come back with fewer photos, but making sure those are meaningful and, and well composed. As I was saying, it can be quite hard to actually find the um, subjects in a rainforest. Um, this is as close as I've got to an ocelot photo over the years. Um, I'm still very thrilled to see it. And I do do a lot of these pictures of the... Um, smaller landscape details to give a bit more of a story to where I've been. Um, I remember walking along the riverbank and seeing all sorts of exciting footprints from capybara, tapir, even jaguar. And I'm always on the lookout for ripe fruit underneath trees because I won't be the only one noticing them. And I do remember very vividly in Borneo, one year um we found a, a fig tree that was fruiting these are some figs that were on the ground underneath and we were re rewarded with this lovely encounter with an orangutan um obviously meeting a primate like this is just um spine tingling and i remember it was the first time i'd actually ever seen one um you do have to be in the right mindset to do anything other than a record shot when you see something exciting and I remember my first few pictures were questionable at best compositionally, but after a while I thought, okay, so calm down. We've got a sharp one on the memory card. Let's try and do something a bit more creative. And so here I've used a shallow depth of field to shoot through the foliage um, to frame up on the orangutan. And Nick alluded to this earlier that rainforests are very messy, chaotic places but we've got to make sure we include that in the picture. You know, it's not like doing photography in a formal gardens where everything's neat and clipped. You want a bit of that chaos and wildness and energy in your pictures, in my opinion. Working out where everything lives is the big challenge then when you visit a tropical rainforest. And that requires very slow progress when you're walking through. Um, you really have to switch on your photographic eyes, I find. And as a group, it's um, obviously quite an advantage to have several people with you. We're all looking high, middle, low in the leaf litter. I often miss most of the birds because I'm looking straight down at my feet half the time. Um, and this was um, a beautiful little sweat bee nest. They, um, they come out and they drink the salt um, in your tears and sweat quite often, which can be frustrating, but they don't sting. Um, and they'd made this lovely little entrance to their nest, which was inside a buttress root in Borneo. I always have to balance how many spider pictures I put in these talks because, um, you know, I, I'm aware that um, fewer people may want to come on our tours if it's all about spiders. I'd say they've all got a beauty to them. Um, this was an arboreal tarantula that was about four metres up um, a tree in Borneo. And she only came out at night. It was very interesting that she shared that um, crevice she was hiding in with the spiderlings, um, that they didn't cannibalise one another. Um, a very unusual behaviour to see, actually. So to get a photograph at all of it was wonderful. Um, so I've not worried too much about the lighting, etc. It was just to get something on the memory card of that. The 
light in the rainforest is a real problem for us. So um, if you want to do handheld natural light photography, you're often limited to quite wide apertures to get fast shutter speeds. Um, sometimes all you can manage is a silhouette such as this. If I want to do a picture of something like this poison frog, this was in Costa Rica with natural light, which was how this shot was done. I have to use a tripod. This was about three seconds, this photograph. Um, and you just have to be methodical and calm about it. Don't go chasing the subjects through the leaf litter. If you approach slowly and methodically, you can get quite close to a lot of these without bothering them. And I certainly wouldn't want to move this to another location. Um, you know, I don't want to bother it. And it's in a very nice little niche there for a composition anyway. You can see here, um, I think Kenneth's actually watching tonight. He said, so good evening, Kenneth. Um, only the finest male models considered in our talks. Kenneth is um, photographing a Katie did here in Ecuador. And he's showing us his wonderful softbox here. That's um, sitting on top of his flash gun and it makes the light from the flash gun a bit softer. So using a camera in one hand and a flash um, softbox in another is a good technique we find in the forest. And this is sort of topping up the available natural light or indeed completely replacing it with the light of the flash. And this is the sort of perspective you might expect to get. So here's another dingy scene. We can see there's a nice poison frog down there, but oh dear, it's it's very murky. Um, if I was to use um, any longer shutter speed, I think we'd be on to about 10 seconds there. So here I've added a little bit of flash into the foreground, but I've maintained a bit of ambient light in the background. So this is a balance of ambient sunlight, albeit very weak, and a bit of flash in the foreground. Understanding flash is so central to good rainforest photography, I feel, particularly for the smaller creatures. Um, it does allow you to completely redesign a scene um, and where better to learn your flash techniques than with a leaf cutter ant colony. Because once you're set up on a branch, you get a never ending stream of workers walking across carrying leaves so you can fine tune things. I do find, though, that it's at night that the rainforest really um, reveals its treasures. So um, I remember walking through the forest and spotting this sleeping anole lizard here. This is an equatorial anole. And just being struck by the beauty of the little droplets sitting all over its scales. Um, and it was just a real pleasure to to get a few pictures of that as it as it slept before moving on. Such a delicate scene. This is actually focus stacked if you're interested. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that later, um, but just a handheld focus stack. So I've taken about three or four pictures, just slowly moving the manual focus through the depth of this subject um, and assembled those four images into one image that shows sharpness. Well, not front all the way to the back, but certainly more sharpness than I'd have had from a single image. The night walks present all sorts of opportunities. And in fact, it can get quite overwhelming at times, particularly by a stream. Here's a glass frog and here are its eggs just hatching. Now the tadpoles um, fall straight into the water source, which is underneath. This was positioned above a stream. You can see using off camera flash here was quite important because it's allowed me to backlight this subject. If the flash had been on the camera, I'd have had a very flat light from the front. Here's a red-eyed leaf frog or red-eyed tree frog, as they're sometimes called, also at night. Nighttime tends to be when the tree frogs come out. You see the poison frogs in the day, um, but the majority of the frogs are active at night. And uh, uh, quite an interesting view of the developing embryos of this red-eyed leaf frog. Um, this is focus stacked, so you can see there's quite a lot of focus detail in those embryos. So here we go. This is another type of flash diffuser. I just thought I'd show you what people are using these days. This is a wonderful homemade one. And um, the idea is that the flash gun does sit on top of your camera, but it's then channeled down this funnel and hits a wide diffuser at the front, spreading the light out and making it a lot softer, a lot more pleasant to look at. And it does allow you to be 
two hands on the camera there, which um, can make you a lot more stable with the work you're doing. Sometimes when you're just trying to focus on something like the plane of these antennae, um, having less to hold is a real advantage. We do help each other out, of course. So uh, Nick and I like to think our role on these trips is to um, improve your photography, um, give you some ideas, point out some exciting creatures. But a large part of it also is holding people's flash guns for them near subjects. Um, and we've, of course, got the patience of saints. So we'll be doing that all night long till our arms fall off. The advantage of flash is that you spot um, a, a creature and you can very quickly get a good photo of it. Um, detail front to back. The flash will actually freeze any camera shake you have. And if you set your camera up in manual mode and your flash in manual mode, you can keep the exposure the same for every shot. So you just walk around at night and if you see an interesting insect, you can get a, a reasonably good picture of it just like that without having to worry too much. I was so excited to see this. This is a velvet worm. Um, it's a very basal creature. Uh, I remember spending a bit of time with this um, because it was a creature I'd wanted to see since I was a kid. And you don't see many of these in the forest. More advanced flash te techniques um, still rely on the same principle of setting your flash up in manual mode and your camera in manual mode. This is um, a bat photography session we did in Costa Rica. I think Nick and I were sort of making up the rules as we went along as to what exposure to have everything on. But we got almost everybody with um, a flight shot of these as they came to nectar at this um, large flower that grows off the side of the tree branches. It didn't last long, um, but it was well worth putting in the effort for. Other types of lighting then. Well, this is a harvestman rather than a spider. Nick showed you a scorpion fluorescing under ultraviolet earlier. And it's actually really interesting to walk around a rainforest at night with an ultraviolet torch. Millipedes, some caterpillars, even some slugs will fluoresce. So it's always worth checking out um, whatever you spot and seeing um, if they glow or not. Some creatures have their own bioluminescence. Um, so they do stand out um, from a long way away. If you turn your head torches off in the forest, Usually after a while, you'll see some insect glowing away. This is a headlamp click beetle. And I was thinking, well, it's, it's very beautiful. Let's try some other ideas with it. So here it is underneath a leaf skeleton as it walked around on the forest floor. And this is a long exposure done in bulb mode on a tripod as the uh, click beetle walked across the forest floor, maybe about 30 seconds. Um, and all that's recorded is the light from its spots there. This does look like a very bland picture, doesn't it? But it's been done for a reason. If you have a look at the um, larger twigs in that scene, I'm going to flick to the second shot here and then flick back and flick forwards again. You can see some of the twigs are actually um, glowing with um, a strange luminous light. This is um, fungal mycelium fluorescing naturally in the decaying wood and I was able to pick this up and um, you'd have been able to read a book by it um, it was it was surprisingly bright this was in Costa Rica so maybe not your classical wildlife photography shot of you know a bird on a stick but that's the whole point we want to get away from those cliches and show you the real ecosystem the real rainforest uh, and give you a chance to capture that in your photography here are the spores emanating from a bracket fungus. Simple shot with the head torch put on the ground below them. Fungus has always attracted me as a subject. I think it's because it doesn't fly off. So you get all the time you want to get the lighting just so. Um, as do lichens, um, another excellent stationary subject for you to hone your macro skills on. But there's a little bit more to this lichen than met the eye initially. To the right of it and below, we've got that um, long conical structure that's also red and white. Now, that is the case of a bagworm, which is um, a, basically a moth caterpillar that's hiding within there. So it's chewed up the lichen and the bark and made that um, defensive case a bit like a caddis fly mite in a stream. Um, it was really interesting to see how it had distributed the red and the, 
the green from that lichen. You can see it more clearly from the side. And this is one that I actually shot in Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire last year, another bagworm. So doing exactly the same thing comes back to what I said at the beginning, that lots of species are behaving broadly the same um, in the invertebrate world, whether they're in England or Peru or Costa Rica. And that can give you a little bit of insight into what to look out for. The camouflage afforded by that bagworm's case um, rather pales by comparison to this lovely eyelash pit viper, though. And I wanted to look a little bit at um, how you work with creatures in situ. This is exactly as we found it um, just in the daytime. It's just um, relaxing there by the path. And obviously, I don't want to get too close to it with the wide angle. So I've pulled back a bit and, and captured it relatively small in the frame there. Wide angle is um, probably the go-to technique for Nikami at the moment. We love capturing things close up but wide so you can see where they live. Um, and, you know, that's that's how we like to see our photography at the moment. Um, I suppose when I started off doing rainforest photography, this was much more my style. So in very close, boxed in around the subject, uh, this is a wonderful jumping spider called Porsche that actually hunts other jumping spiders and orb spiders that are actually sitting in their webs. It's um, a very intelligent spider, if I can use that word in that context. Um, it's, it's an incredible subject in its own right. A little bit more about the um, lens choice then, you know, whether you should go tight in, um, such as um, this, this group of caterpillars done with a a macro lens from a little further back, but, you know, we're basically just um, building the shot around that group of caterpillars. Or if we should use a wider lens, such as here, to capture a bit of context too. Um, I'll show you the lens setup for this. This strange contraption is a probe lens made by Lauer. Um, there's a, a bizarre flash unit on top of that as well that I'm using. All makes it look quite complicated and space age, but... All it's doing is putting a very wide angle lens right in amongst the action. Um, and you can get some incredible bug's eye perspectives of subjects with it. And we have seen quite a few guests wielding these as well. We had five on one trip once. So um, you feel like a, a group of musketeers setting out into the forest with those sometimes. And this is the sort of perspective we're after. Creature in its habitat. It's so much fun and um, yeah, it lets you play with the scale. Here we go, a little tiny ant transiting at just the right moment. Um, so we get the comparable size of that Katie did there. <laughs> the, um, the reason I included this is because, of course, you don't always get everything coming together compositionally. Um, I'm sure with AI software these days, it would be very easy to remove that concrete path if if you so wish to. But my point is, I always want to come back with um, a set of images that can tell a story. Um, I give a lot of talks, I write articles, but I think whatever you do with your images, it's important to move through that range of lenses you've got with you. Um, keep changing your sort of um, compositional style so that your image set isn't too stagnant when you show it as a whole. Here we go, same subject, um, but wider now and low down. This earthworm can get to 75 centimetres. It's a ridiculous thing. Here's another beautiful little invertebrate. This is a mirror spider, and it um, will actually camouflage itself as a raindrop. So I've been um, looking for these for quite some time, and it was a, a real pleasure to discover some in Ecuador this year. When they move, the um, guanine in there, um, just under their exoskeleton, will move around and fragment into little plates. So you see the red coloration coming through then. But um, when, when they're at rest, um, the, the shiny surface gradually expands again and they, they sort of melt away like a little raindrop under the leaf. I do think spiders get um, hard press sometimes. Uh, I find them... So beautiful, you know, you can work with the silk, um, their legs backlight beautifully. And most of the spiders I deal with in rainforests are at most a centimetre in size. Um, you're often searching under individual leaves for quite some time to find these um, these beautiful subjects. 
sometimes though um you find a scene like this where you've got a spider that's succumbed to a cordyceps fungus so this fungus has taken over the spider's body and is currently um, producing lots of little mushrooms all over it and in fact cordyceps fungi can infect a huge range of invertebrates is a little butterfly this is a cricket um, and it's really interesting to go searching for subjects like these that uh, may be something that it would be easy to walk past um, because they're not so colourful, vibrant, just look like a little sort of um, bit of white fluff on a leaf when you see them initially. But there's so much you can say about them in terms of um, the biology. I don't even know what subject um, this once was before it got infected, but those strands coming off with the little clubs on are effectively the mushrooms growing out of that um, unfortunate host there. I'd like to take a little bit of time to discuss how you can include the um, habitat um, in your shots. Yes, but also do some bigger landscapes. You know, remember, even if you're a diehard um, macro photographer like I am, to so include plenty of bigger scenes. Um, I I try to also do some shots just of the the context of where I am in terms of smaller landscapes within the bigger ones. So. Um, if I flip across here, we've got um, a, a moth's wing that's um, probably from a predated moth stuck onto a leaf. And it's the sort of scene that you could easily go past. But I was really attracted by the echo of the colours in that wing um, sort of from the forest that we see around. This is a hummingbird's feather, um, tiny little entity. Once again, it's it's maybe not the most obvious subject, um, but I find when you go in really close on something like this, there are some beautiful details to be had. I remember Nick's excitement when we saw this snake skin too. I think he photographed it with a very wide lens. I was fascinated um, with this smaller landscape detail, if you like, just um, the, the trace of what had been there before. Obviously, we didn't see the big snake, but it's still fascinating um, to record this. When working with shiny or glossy subjects, um, such as this frog, diffusion is so important. So you can see the catch light on this smoky jungle frog's eye is very soft at the edge. And that comes from using a nice large diffuser. I should also say that from an ethical point of view, um, when I'm using flash with frogs, I put my camera on a very high ISO, such as 1600 or 3200. And that lets me use a weak flash power um, to minimise any disturbance. I wanted to just include um, this shot here because this lovely walking stick, which is um, related to um, grasshoppers, it can, can jump quite a long way, um, was a shot that I'd spent maybe about 20 minutes <laughs> moving in on thinking about the lighting and then right at the end when I took the frame that little jumping spider ran in and photobombed it which um, I think just goes to show there's a certain element of serendipity to all this photography I think when you get home and you share some of these pictures with friends and family they don't realize maybe just how long they will have taken you um, you obviously you've had a nice time doing them but it's not like um, maybe some of the hide photography that you can do in other parts of the world where it's kind of served up on a plate for you. You've got to really work um, for a lot of these shots. A little bit about the ecotourism side of things as well, because I'm sure if you're like me, um, such dark issues as carbon footprints from flights, um, the impact of tourism in general, like they... They come up in conversation more and more these days, and so they should. And I have to sort of think about how I can justify doing what I do as a wildlife photographer. Is it right to travel to these places? And I was particularly moved um, by the experience we had in Ecuador this year, where we visited an indigenous community um, who we actually um, made a, a donation to through the, the tour fund. Um, and they were able to find an alternative to the oil explo exploration that was so rampant in the area. So by um, 
allowing them to go the ecotourism route this is basically in somebody's back garden there um, an old stump that seemed to be frequented by macaws every day and and to make an income from that they were able to look after that stretch of forest um, for future generations and um, certainly on that level things were making sense for me you could see um, as he traveled up and down the river lots of examples of the oil industry there and um, it was a sort of ever-present threat. So it was it was really lovely to see where um, private individuals had decided not to sell the rights to their land um, to these ventures and instead look after the forest. But you have to choose, really. Do you want these chugging up and down the river um, or perhaps this reality um, in some healthy forest being supported by the ecotourism? The boats are actually a really excellent way of exploring the forest. Um, you can travel in near silence and the wildlife seems to accept you very readily. A giant river otter that quite a few locations we've visited where we've seen these. Um, Peru being a good a good spot and Ecuador. Um, the Cayman as we're drifting by. Even the primates on the um, river's edge seem to... Just be that little bit more trusting of you, probably knowing that you're not going anywhere quickly if you're drifting along in a canoe. It's a beautiful way to spend an afternoon. So that's sort of one option we have for um, maybe winning the trust of animals, getting a little bit closer. Another option is, of course, the the hides and the, the feeding stations that um, Nick said lots about earlier, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on. I must say there are some good setups and some that I find very tedious. I'm, I get itchy feet very quickly and I want to go off and explore the forest more than anything. Um, but I must say when we do find um, a situation where you can see a hummingbird as beautiful as this, even my heart melts a little and I have to have a go. Um, I still prefer entirely um, natural encounters, if you like. Here's a here are some scarlet macaws that I found um, just, just as, uh, as I was walking around in Costa Rica. So it can happen, but I have to admit the encounter rate is quite low if you just leave it to chance in such a way. This was um, a very hearty day out. The rain was pouring down and we thought, what better than to go out and explore with the cameras? Um, actually, if I just hop back, you can see a plastic bag makes a very suitable piece of equipment there to keep everything dry and you know you're you're really on an adventure because you don't know what you're going to find next um, particularly in the macro world there'll be excited squeals from further back in the group when somebody discovers a, a new beetle or a, a beautiful frog etc there's a great energy amongst everyone and um i find it's it's really good fun to um share these ideas that you get for compositions with the group so sometimes two or three of us will have a go at something like this before the subject maybe moves on or, or we move on indeed here's a praying mantis peeping out um, from a little gap in the leaves and you can see this is the view i had of it and i remember i think it was probably um nick who was with me at this stage we both had a go at um shooting this subject with the probe lens and we then tried it with a 400 mil lens instead, just to get um, a little bit of variation in composition and light. Um, but I know had I not been with someone else, I wouldn't have explored all those compositions in the same way. You, you know, you're feeding off everybody else's ideas um, and moving on together. Here's a very simple idea for a shot. So there's a spider on a leaf, yes, but if I put the flash underneath, it backlights the whole scene and we get the light flooding through its translucent body, a very much green on green picture. I personally prefer this second image here. We do run moth traps. Um, we have our own portable one, but very often lodges, as Nick said, have their own facilities in that regard. You can see a praying mantis has been attracted there too. Um, it provides a really interesting opportunity in the morning to have a look at what's come in. I'm always struck by the biodiversity. You might only see one of each species on that sheet, but there'll be about, I don't know, 300 different moths on there. Um, and it's just incredible to, to witness. If you get your lighting right, you can actually photograph them in situ on the sheet um, or on a piece of paper, perhaps. 
And I like doing these little montages just to really show the biodiversity of what you can get from a single moth trap. This was um, in the Choco Forest in Ecuador. Of course, um, it wouldn't be a photography trip without a little bit of laptop time, much as we loathe it. There's usually quite a lot of rain. <laughs> so we do get opportunities to put the cameras down from time to time um, and then Yeah, often get together as a group and have a little look through techniques um, that we can use, often quite basic. Um, this is focus stacking. So um, lots of people say, can you show me focus stacking at the beginning of the trip? And then we'll try and work that into the agenda. Um, here's another example using a grey card. So you photograph that in the field. And this is a shot that's not been white balanced. And then this second one, has had its white balance copied off this earlier grey card. So you can neutralise this rather yellow cast in the image um, to show its true colours. So there we go. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that um, insight from Nick and from me about what it is we do on these trips. Um, yeah, we've got a few being designed at the moment um a few that are alive right now we we've got time for some questions as well so emma if if you're still there after all of that um over to you i am here thank you so much both of you i'm i mean i didn't want that to end never mind everybody else at home wanting to watch it um and i think it's really interesting thinking about you know all the different trips that we run and what makes these so different and I think generally anything in a rainforest is has kind of a mystical element and I think you've both kind of alluded to that a bit but I think the the fact that you just have the time to find something that you're not necessarily looking for or that you don't know you're going to find and then you know getting that quick uh, record shot which probably is with your flash or whatever it is and then having the time to kind of explore it and move around and find the best angle. And yes, you can do that a bit more on other trips. It's harder when you're in a vehicle. Um, but I think having that time and the freedom to do that is really kind of one of the beauties of these trips and what, what it affords you. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, before I forget, um, I'm going to launch a poll, um, which will basically give any of you guys the opportunity to um, request some information. So from the trips that um, Nick and Alex have both shown, um, whether it's uh, Borneo or Ecuador or um, Austria, Peru, we still have some spaces on some of them. If we don't have spaces or I know a couple of them are still in the making, um, then we have lists of uh, where you can register your interest. So as soon as they launch, we'll then get in touch with you. So do let us know if there's any of those that you'd uh, like to hear about. Can I just yes. jump in there, Emma, and point out we are aware that Austria is not renowned for <laughs> yeah. tropical rainforest. Um, it's just that that's another one that we do together. So there It's you just go. a really great trophy and you didn't want to leave it out, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd qualify, clarify that um good so we've had a few questions um so I think one of the things that obviously a lot of people are thinking and Alex I think you probably fueled slightly the fire with your kit bag photo um it, the I not really the ideal kit but obviously you guys take a variety of lenses um and I know Alex you probably have more of a variety than most um so what should somebody consider bringing if it's their first time or if they're just kind of wanting a bit of a variety, like a rainforest photography shop, a workshop, what would you put in your bag? Yeah, I'm just you... wondering, can we get to a different view where we can kind of see us talking? I think if you unshare your screen. Yeah, just, it'll... Uh, me All too. Right. No, you're good. Right. Okay, stop share that better so it's a bit more personal and what's better you can see us but i'm not sure that's see us, but yeah. there we go <laughs> we're scratching our heads what, what would we take for a rainforest trip well um i'd say a, a macro lens in around around the sort of 100 mil range would be a good idea a simple flash gun with some means of getting it off camera so it could be um, a ttl cord that you can plug into the hot shoe and then into the camera or even a radio trigger. I think a tripod, unfortunately, Nick, wouldn't you say? 
absolutely so like a tripod around um yeah. a sort of tele zoom like 100 to 400 is very popular um and then a, a wide lens like maybe a, a sort of 16 to 35 and that would serve you very well you'd have a wonderful time and in fact that's really what i should take because i spend this time lugging it all around and it actually go quite a lot slower because the bag's so heavy you get this this terrible inertia where you almost can't bear to stop because you've got so much weight on your back um so i envy the people who are decisive enough to just head out with two or three lenses i also take the lower probe lens which actually um, here it is here is lenses lying around in this room um so that whilst it's quite long doesn't weigh very much so i don't know nick if i just had to have one lens in the rainforest would it be this what do you think oh, old. perhaps at the moment maybe I, yeah. I think what's also worth adding is that it's very very rare on any excursion on any particular day that you would take everything with you um any session that we might be doing will obviously have or is likely to have an emphasis in one direction or another. So we would always be able to advise anyone traveling with us that at any particular time, these two or three lenses might be worth taking and the others perhaps leave behind. I know leaving behind a bit of kit's always tinged with an element of danger that you inevitably something will come along and you wish you'd got it with you but most of the time you can pare down things for any particular session or as you've alluded to you know there are times when you just say no I'm just going to go out with one thing and therefore concentrate my efforts on looking for images that are appropriate with the kit I've got with me at that time which is a really good approach in many instances because it, it makes you think so much more mm. about the images you're taking. And it, it's just as valid to just take your iPhone, you know, <laughs> other brands are available, but, you know, <laughs> you're there to record the nature you see. Um, and I, I we've got several um, several guests who enjoy shooting with phones these days. And, and whilst 10 years ago, you probably wouldn't have done that. It is frustrating how their pictures are generally better than ours, aren't they, Nick? We've got how many thousand pounds worth <laughs> there, and then it's a snap. That's the way it is. And any other questions then, Emma? Yeah, quite a few. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one with that because I think it, it is that old saying that the best lens you have is the one that you have with you, and I think everyone can get quite hung up on what to take with them. Um, but it's always good to have an idea of what the ideal is and also what the minimum is really and I think I don't know about you but I think if anybody is generally coming on a trip where there's going to be a macro element I think having a macro lens is you know not necessary but it's definitely going to help you more a lot of people always ask if it is necessary to have one and I would say yes even if it's an older version of one but something that has a macro capability will give you much more yeah. um, scope rather than Absolutely. you know the 100 to 400 is fantastic, but if you have a macro lens or access to one, definitely bring one. Yeah. Um, well, I would say if you had to pick three lenses, so a wide angle, zoom, 100 mil thereabouts macro, and then a 80 to 400, 100 to 400, something in that range. And between those three lenses, you would cover 80 to 90 percent of your likely opportunities reasonably well yeah mm -hmm. um and a couple of questions and it's a question that we get a lot and I'm always a bit loath to ask it but about weight and baggage limits and things like that and I know you know a lot of airlines now are, are being a bit more stingy um I've definitely come across a couple of of issues with it but generally you show them you know you zip open the bag and show them all the cameras and they go carry on never mind you know they're not going to put it in the hold but I know it's something that a lot of people worry about so it would just be interesting to get your take on that um obviously it's a concern and you have to pack accordingly but by and large in all of the locations we go to we we managed to get by. Alex and I do travel with a lot of kits and some of it we put into a pelly case and check into the hold. 
but we'll also have a photo rucksack backpack which can routinely weigh anywhere between 15 and 18 kilograms um a lot of airlines now are happy with that providing the bag within itself fits within a cradle the weight of it isn't so much an issue i know there are some airlines that still do weigh things but it really depends on the airline you're traveling with it you have to cut your cloth according to their rules but most of the time we get away with it. I mean, if someone is playing hardball, I do also travel with um, a sort of jacket with big pockets in and end up stuffing seven or eight kilos of kit into pockets and then just presenting a much lighter backpack. But most of the time I don't have to do that these days. Yeah, that I, I second that. I, I have a very compact, um, sorry, my image appears to have frozen. Is it? In a that's particularly, oh, that's better. Thank God for that. Um, I have a very compact little cargo jacket. This is a net thing that folds down to the size of an apple. And I, I keep it in my camera bag and don't even think about it. And if I'm at an airport, I can put most of my gear in it. It's just made of netting, really. And you'd look silly getting on a plane with it, but it would be perfectly OK within the regulations. That's the point. So if, like me, you do panic a bit about all that, get yourself a little netty cargo jacket thing <laughs> yeah i think the uh manufacturers of fishermen's vests uh, yes, are yeah. a roaring trade since the photo trips have taken off haven't they yeah. um so on from lenses to a bit more about lighting so uh, it's an issue that i think it, it's always a really hard balance in a rainforest isn't it with lighting and i think you know you've shown really well the different techniques and using natural light which obviously is what we prefer to do whereas sometimes you need a torch or a flash or um you know and sometimes you see in rainforests photos of frogs which i can't bear to look at because their eyes are like slits and you realize that somebody's been flashing at them for god knows how long and they're probably going to be stuck on that leaf all night um mm. so there is a really tricky balance but um there's a couple of questions about lighting first um the mammals at night um is that just spotlight has there been any flash or kind of additional lighting but also you know when like in Danham Valley I know I had a lot um orangutans quite high up in the tree canopy and how do you balance that if they're moving you know sometimes you just have to go it's probably not the best time for a, sh a photo but if you do want to capture it kind of what are your tips for that Shall I go, Alex, to begin with? Seeing or... as I didn't have any mammal pictures in my bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would, I mean, one of the beauties, of course, now is with camera technology as it is, particularly the uh, better quality um, cameras, high ISO capabilities are such that a lot of pictures that would have either required flash or been impossible previously are now possible because you can ratchet up the ISO to 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 and more and still get a workable image. So the necessity to use flashes frequently in some instances has diminished and therefore natural light options certainly become much more um, prevalent. Using a tripod buys you more flexibility as well. Um, so those would be the first two things that I would look to do, certainly in daylight, because we would always, by choice, want to photograph things in natural light um, initially. And only if necessary, do you then want to look to augment that with some form of additional light, whether that be simply bouncing light in from a reflector, which can make all the difference, um, using a torch to bounce light in or then going to a flash gun. Um, obviously at night it becomes a necessity to use a flash gun but again keeping things simple often pays dividends um, I might travel with three or four flash guns but I often find that the best results are with a single flash gun and a diffuser um, to then bounce light back in from the opposite direction just to help balance things and as Alex alluded to because we now have cameras that do produce wonderful images at high ISO values, we can still use high ISO values with flash, which means the amount of flash power required to create the image is much more, um, much reduced, and therefore you're having less impact on your subject, either 
reduced power of flash or less um, the flash duration is much shorter and obviously you're balancing those requirements so as you've said emma you know you don't like seeing frogs with tiny little slits as eyes so we would always try to leave them be under darkness set everything up go in take a couple of shots let them rest a while take a few more shots rather than just blatting them time after time after time after time um with lots of flash guns because with technology now that's just not necessary mm. yeah and your um like the clouded leopard and um tarsiers and things like that when you take them at night is that mainly with the spotlight from the vehicle or from a no from a... those those are with flash um the tarsier for instance i'm on foot and so that's again a single flash gun with a diffuser because i'm able to get or was in that instance able to get close enough so a diffuser made a difference um the leopard cat shot um wish it was a clouded leopard sadly isn't but a leopard cat shot um that was taken with a single flash held off camera so i didn't get the eye reflection but again focusing up using a torch i was very lucky in that in that particular instance the cat was happy to sit still and i was i don't know 10 12 meters away from it cameras on a tripod get everything set up get focused up etc and then just move the camera off flash because i have a radio trigger and then i'm able to take a few shots with the camera off flash but keep the shots to a minimum you obviously you can look on the back of the camera see that you've got a workable image and then you can leave the subject alone you're not having to take dozens of pictures which we might have done back in the days of film or when technology wasn't as advanced as it is now and we're forced to do different things I mean, ISO 8000, I, I use that now. Yeah. You know, it's that workable. Makes it anxious. Yeah, yeah, with, with noise bit, reduction. It feels a bit weird, but yeah, you yeah. can you can do it. And um, I think, yeah, not yeah, noise reduction software does help as well. But um, yeah, you're, you're paying. When you get a new camera these days, when somebody releases a new one, the main thing you should be looking at is its low light performance, I think. You know, the... They've got all the megapixels they need now and the sort of frame rates. It's, it's the low light performance. That's what makes a difference. I felt for years that whenever I did wildlife photography, I was always about a stop away from having enough light. I don't know about you. It's like, oh, if only yeah. I could shoot at a 60th, not a 30th. Why? Like every time. But now you can. You know, it's such a nice time to be a, a wildlife yeah. photographer. I mean, look at the the arsenal of kit we've got our, at our disposal wow. now. I'm not saying there's no excuse, but um, that there's less excuse for getting it. Now. Yeah. Um. So going back to locations, I know you guys have got a few things that you're planning um for coming years, trying to fit into your busy schedules. Um. Are there any plans to anywhere like the Congo? I mean. Uh <laughs> not at the moment. That's, that's no. a good, good um, one. I'd like to go there. <laughs> not that I want to add to your list. I know you're busy anyway. <laughs> well, uh, one of the one of the reasons is um, I've been I've never been to the Congo. Love to go. I'd love to go to a place called Zangabai, for instance. But I've been to Central African rainforest in Gabon, and one of the reasons that it's not really feasible to run a rainforest trip in the way that we've just described for the destinations we currently um, run trips to is that it's just not feasible to wander around in central african rainforests in the way that you can in a forest in borneo or latin america it's too dangerous it's just not allowed you know, there are elephants there are buffalo there are all sorts of things that are fairly dangerous and therefore walking wandering around in the way that we like to do it is just not an option um it's just not allowed or it's it's there just aren't facilities to to allow it and to, so you have to be you know, the, the trips have a very different feel about them you know when you go to a buy for instance you're, you're you're on a platform and you're just captive on a platform viewing the wildlife wonderful experience but you're not able to go wandering around in the forest discovering whatever you might find um 
so not really the sort of destination where we could run a trip in the way that we would like to there's so much stuff there that we'd love to go and see and explore and i think also there are political issues of course in some of those central african countries which make visiting a little more difficult and questionable so mm. at the moment much as i'd love to go to car or some of those neighboring countries um there are other locations that just allow us to do what we like doing with a greater degree of ease yep yep <laughs> Well, and that's it. That's part of it. Is that freedom, isn't it? That we've talked about. Yeah. That you you just want to be able to go out and, you know, especially somewhere like Costa Rica. You know, when everybody yeah. was sitting inside having dinner, and I just went, just going to go out with my lens, obviously, and my flash, missing the cocktails. But I found about thirty red eyed tree frogs at the you know the side of a pond, and you think you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that in a lot of places. So yeah. safety is is quite a big ish, you know. Yeah. That, that sort of effort to glory ratio <laughs> in um, Costa Rica it's yeah it's a particularly good example of where you, you can operate safely and, and easily to to focus on your photography really without having to worry about a huge amount of other stuff yeah yeah definitely um just talking a bit more about mammals it's just an interesting one because I um there's quite a lot of press at the moment or well photos on photography sites about the black leopards in um India and in Lycopia um which have been quite uh much photographed recently um and are quite tricky to get a slot to go and see by all accounts but um there have been some photos especially kind of mid last year of one in Latin America or a few in Latin America and there are a number of um instances of them definitely but um I know there's one lodge in Brazil that we actually use on our best of Brazil trip that has I think tagged one um but do you guys know of anywhere particularly that you can go to see any I mean it's a you know obviously it's a very difficult thing to see but just wondered if you had any insight you know uh short answer is no <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um melanistic cats in Latin America are obviously incredibly rare um, and the habitat means that they're even more you know, rarely seen. Um, I think you've, uh, Emma, are probably alluding to Trajanjao in Brazil, where yeah. I think there is a known black jaguar. Yeah. Um, I, there was, for a period of time, a black jaguar occasionally seen at Cristalino as well in Brazil, but I haven't heard anyone mention that for umpteen years. Um, so I think, again, it's, to my knowledge, yeah. simply going anywhere to see a cat in Latin America other than the Pantanal to see jaguars is obviously uh, very challenging. Um, all right, pumas down in Torres del Paine, but that's not rainforest, so that's obviously slightly different. But any of the rainforest locations, a glimpse of a cat is a rarity. A glimpse of a black cat, well, you know, that's winning the lottery sort of um, levels of rarity. So uh, I just don't, I don't think there's anywhere. And if, if there was somewhere that became apparent, the price would go through the roof. And as you say, it would just be impossible to get a booking to go there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And that's the thing. I think it, it's great if you find it and you're, you're lucky. And then as soon as anybody else finds out about it, that's it. It's yeah. going to be yeah. touristified. Yeah, I know the, the, the leopard in Lycipia now, that particular yeah. camp is, I mean, it's, it's yeah. tripled in price and you can't get a slot for love and the money. You know? no, it's you crazy. Have to book a two hour slot in a private vehicle to be able to go and see it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Pamela, I can see that you've raised your hand, but I, I don't really know what to do with that. So if you, oh, hang on, I should put it in there. No. So if you can put it in the chat or the q and we'll, <laughs> we'll ask um, Nick and Alex. Um, oh, Paul, <laughs> how often do you come across unwanted little critters in the rooms that we use? Well, no, they're all wanted. They're all wanted. Yeah. <laughs> that was going to be the answer. I don't think there's... Yeah, nothing's unwanted. <laughs> it's only Nick Garbutt's. That's the only thing I'd like to see banished from my room <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no we we have we did have some 
bullet ants in somebody's room. Oh, I mean, it's a rainforest. You know, that's the thing. It's not. Yeah. I mean, Costa Rica's possibly a little tamer than some, but even there, you can get some naughty things appearing. Yeah. So we do remind people about the the health and safety side quite rigorously mm. on a regular basis. You know, don't put your bag down and expect nothing will have wandered into it. And you know, it's all part of the bioabundance of a rainforest. Um, but yeah, I generally I get quite excited by the the guests mm. coming to the room. <laughs> The critter guests. Yeah. And if if there's, we're, we're kind of the ghostbusters, you know, who you're going to call us. <laughs> we'll come and sort it out. and um, After you've taken a few photos. Of, and, yeah, enjoy yeah, the process. Get out and flash food, unit. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Um. So Marlene's going off to Costa Rica next week and is asking kind of what, you know, what would be, say, in your top five packing list. Obviously, you've got your cameras and you've got your safari shirts and your long legs and your long arms and things and I would say waterproofs and ponchos because like Alex said it rains a lot um anything else you would recommend as a an addition to the last minute packing list I quite like this little light that oh. I'm using instead of a flash it's a continuous light so oh it's got this sort it's of still on disco I don't really <laughs> want that load how embarrassing that's no I know how to use this um uh, there we go. So you can adjust the color temperature of it, um, which is nice. So you can you can zip from cold light to warm light. And it's really good to just say I pop it on the forest floor and it could put a little bit of backlighting in behind a mushroom. But you're leaving the overall scene um, unchanged with flash. You have to take a picture to see what the result will be, whereas continuous light is what you see is what you get. Um, so. Yeah, this is a little unit by Godox, I think. Um, only about 20 quid. Yeah, I wish it didn't have the disco mode. I um, don't know what that's for, really. Um, the other thing is I always wear a, a Tilly hat, which doesn't look particularly cool, I'm, I'm told, but um, a sort of cotton hat that can shrug the rain off, um, especially because I'm a glasses wearer um it's, i just couldn't be without it and the sun of course i do actually on on the note of eyesight i mean it affects everyone there's rainforest photography with glasses oh my goodness it's, it's a really tricky thing to get right so i do bring disposable contact lenses um for night walks because it gets so humid with the camera rammed up against your face um nick you usually lose your glasses don't you on the first I do. Day? Yeah. <laughs> rattling around for things <laughs> um but yeah i i think like checking you've got things like um a good medical kit with you like some really good tweezers you know um hopefully you're not going to need them um and something that nick and i maybe not in costa rica but somewhere like borneo that's just a whole lot more humid would be some silica packs to dry out your gear so um you know, like you get the tiny little sachets of gel that say do not eat on them in a new box of shoes or something. That's no use. It needs to be like a, a kilo bag of it. And you can seal your gear in with it um, if it's got wet and it'll, it'll pull the moisture out. So um, that's that saved the day a few times, I know. Um, I, I would add um, a good quality, and I stress good quality head torch, um, Mm -hmm. so often we see clients come on a trip with a little piddly head torch that barely illuminates their boots let alone the path on which they're walking or any critters that they might find um so investing in something that throws a decent pool of light a good distance um I think is well worthwhile. Um, a, it makes walking around at night safer because you can actually see what you're doing and you're not just looking at your shoes and where you're putting each foot, but you can actually look for things to photograph as well. So mm. I would always add that in as something that I think's worth perhaps thinking out, thinking about a little more closely. 
Um, it makes such a difference. And on the subject of the fact that it rains a lot, um, a small packable umbrella, um, I often stick in my camera bag. You know, one of the things that, that packs down to 15 centimetres and um, is very, very small. They're very flimsy, but um, if you're caught in a sudden downpour or indeed if you want to be out in photographing in the rain, it's something you can hold over. Not you, you don't count, but your camera, um, you can dry off. You know, your skin's, your skin's fairly water resilient, but cameras in deluges tend not to be. So um, I always have one of those packed in my camera bag just in case. You can spot an Englishman in a rainforest. <laughs> his little umbrella <laughs> over his camera. <laughs> over his camera, not himself, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, they, these are quite handy. These clamps, they're called. So you can clamp that onto your tripod or a, a branch or something. And then these um, foam-lined jaws um, are nice and soft to hold a, um, maybe a stem of a plant. And what that will do is stop things wobbling around in the wind so say there's a praying mantis on a, a branch but it's swaying too much the whole branch is swaying you can stop that branch swaying gently with this clip and then take maybe a, a three second exposure of it on a tripod so um yeah just one, one of those is quite handy they're called plamps p-l-a-m-p by wimberley and i'm not on commission either i just genuinely use these Fab. Um, yeah, and I think I think the only other things I'd add is probably except a big puncher, which can cover all of your gear in your bag and you um, a waterproof cover for your camera. So whether it is a plastic bag, as modelled by one of the guests on Alexis Trip, Kenneth. or an, yes, yeah, sorry, Kenneth, hi yeah. Kenneth, um, or on a a, a proper one, um, which you can get to kind of strap round, and you've got Velcro, and that will cover your lens. So. I think especially when you've got the the telescopic lenses that do extend and water gets in there, it can be quite tricky. So definitely worth investing in something like that if you can. Um, and also for rainforests, especially kind of Borneo places like that, a knee pad type thing, whether it's a, yeah. um, you know, one of those things that you get for gardening or you get the ones that you can actually strap around your knees, something like that, because you do tend to uh, kneel down quite a lot and, you know, it, generally you give up caring about your clothes after about 20 minutes um but it is quite nice if you've got sore knees or if you are in spiky things on the floor then it's always good to protect yourself you, are you going to say something alex well i just say nick and i peg personal comfort pretty low for ourselves <laughs> these are all things i'm nodding along that would be quite a good idea <laughs> <laughs> sorry i mean a knee pad for the camera obviously yeah. sorry <laughs> um and yeah chris has just said uh a, a spare camera which is all, also a really good idea because i think if you're you know if if anything happens to it if it does get water in it you need to put it in a bowl of rice overnight have a spare one with you so if you have the luxury of two cameras do bring them both along um right one or two more but alex i'm gonna ask you a favor can you sorry it can you share your screen again please just to get that last page up let me so. just get to it first yeah. Or I'll have um, to give the whole slideshow again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, while Alex does that, I will just pose the last question, which is um, one that we also get quite often, you know, with the kit um, discussion is can you go on trips like this with a bridge camera? Yes. Excellent. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add? Or is that it? <laughs> well, well, like the short answer is more powerful. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Definitely. It's I true. Mean, I mean, the thing is, and I think especially nowadays, the bridge cameras are so much better than they used to be. They've, you know, you've got all those lenses in one tiny um, package. Um, your sense is going to be smaller. Your quality may not be as good, but you'll yeah. still have all the same opportunities. So um, yeah. you might struggle with a few of the flash things. So I think that's probably what Nick would agree with me on. Um <laughs> It's often some bridge cameras will still have a hot shoe and, and allow you some options. But if it's a pop up flash on top of the bridge camera, then you'll just have to be creative in how you diffuse that. Um, I would say, you know, don't don't turn up on a trip like this and just get the camera out of the box for the first time when you're there, because that, that's not the time to <laughs> 
get used to a camera you know obviously we're there to help you develop your skills but um yeah it's um you want it to be by the end of the trip a bit like driving so you know you're not worried about the actual operation of the equipment more you're looking for the subjects um because that that's what it's all about really but yeah bridge cameras have their place and we, we do see them on trips Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, guys. I think um, everybody's enjoyed looking through the photos, learned a lot. It's always a pleasure to see and hear you both. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody mm -hmm. would like to book any of the trips with Nick and Alex um, or any of the, the photography workshops, there is a special offer for £100 per person off if you message us with the RF Zoom 24 uh, code. Um, and the next talks next week so we've got nick back um on the 12th uh can't tell you what day that is sorry tuesday maybe tuesday next week yeah, think, excellent yeah. um and then uh talking about madagascar which um you won't find anyone who knows more about it i don't think um so anybody considering a trip to madagascar or booked on one do pop along to that on tuesday and then we've got wildlife of the uk with mike dilger on thursday night um so mike runs anything from uh the Somerset levels right up to the Shetlands for us a um, number of different trips so he will be talking about a variety of wildlife there um, and that is it from us so thank you sorry we've run on a bit longer um, but thank you very much for joining us thank you again Nick and Alex and we'll see you next Thanks, time everyone. All right. good evening Thanks, everyone. everyone bye, bye.